What's up, Mia? What's up? <laughs> you know, someone's gonna say that it's autism, but I'm like, whenever I hear that question, I'm like, what is up? And then I have to like really honestly answer you. Oh Lord, yeah, like literally. I know, I know, it's- Somebody uh, would say it's autism. So I feel like I that's been coming up for me a lot where I'm like, why am I like this? And then I can like hear the peanut gallery. Someone in their car is like, <laughs> I could tell you. <laughs> it's in your tizzin. Welcome, welcome to the tiz. Welcome to you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Okay. Well, we wanted to introduce ourselves because maybe been a minute before since we've like said who we are. You go first, please. Oh, okay. I was gonna tell you go first. No. Um I'm Mia Schachter. I use they, them pronouns. I am a writer, which is something I'm working on saying first and foremost. Um, I'm also a consent educator and an intimacy coordinator for TV and film and theater, um, multi-hyphenate artist. <laughs> can't can't choose for my to save my life. Um, <laughs> I am the twink half of this podcast. What's up? Does that feel complete for you, Mia? Do you feel complete? I mean, there's so many other things I could say, mainly that that I have a cat on my lap. I was gonna um, say dog parent, yeah. Yeah, animal parent, plant parent. Um, Long Moolah uh, walks on the beach. Actually, you hate the beach. Yeah, excellent parallel parker. I do hate oh. the beach. Are you an excellent parallel parker? I'm also very good parallel parker. Yeah. I love, love parallel parking. Oh yeah, light of my life. Mm -hmm. I even kind of like, don't like the backup camera. Like I'm mm. like, I just want the old fashioned way. Yeah, yeah. Put your arm over the back seat and look. I yeah. did the ballet in oh. like my early 20s. And so I learned how to do it just using the side mirrors. Oh. I feel like a real baddie when I do that. Wow. Anyway, I'm Risden. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I'm also an intimacy coordinator and consent educator and restorative practices facilitator and surrogate partner. And I'm are you school. still saying that you were doing that? Yeah, that's a thing we could talk about. Um, she's back. She's back, baby. Um, okay. And uh, what else? I'm in school to be a therapist, supposedly, because I want to be a sex therapist, and that's that. Sexologist. Mm. Cool. Oh, and I'm and I'm a whore. I'm the whore half of this <laughs> of this podcast. Professional stupper. Yeah. Stupper. <laughs> I love that word. I love that too. Great. Um, cool. And this podcast is about like consent 2.0, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what we say. Okay. Consent 2.0. There's so much more than yes and no. There's so much more than yes and no. It rhymes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so yeah, I'm curious. So you're back. She's back. They're back. <laughs> uh, yeah. So surrogate partner therapy, we've talked about generally what that means. What my conflict with the work and what I've noticed a lot of other colleagues, especially my AFAB colleagues um, in the Oh, wait, field. sorry. Can we say what surrogate partner therapy is? Yes, of course. So okay. surrogate partner therapy is triadic therapy um, based in the work of Masters and Johnson. It's usually um, indicated for clients that have sexual and relational issues. So we treat people, uh, clients with ED, vaginismus, attachment stuff. Um people who are just really, who are like coming out late in life, people who are uh, doing gender transition, um, basically people who are like, I am having some fear or dysfunction around sex and I need like a safe uh, place to therapeutically reorient myself basically. So there's a therapist on the case and a surrogate. The surrogate is basically um, a, a surrogate partner. So we, we are the girlfriend or the boyfriend or the they friend for this person so it's <laughs> relational work as well as sexual work but it starts off with a lot of like consent education and like touch-based work somatics whatever and eventually gets to erotic level work um if that's indicated i would say like 15 percent of the work is that hmm. um but what myself and a lot of my colleagues have noticed, I've mostly heard it from my AFAB colleagues, is that um, it's really hard to move through the entirety of the spectrum of the work um, from, you know, teaching somebody how to receive touch to erotic level, like PNV intercourse work can be, it just brings up a lot of 
ick um, and discomfort and can be really challenging. So something we're sort of exploring is I'm working with a colleague right now who does the beginning level work. And then when the erotic, the person graduates to erotic, they pass them off to me. Oh, that's so, really interesting. Mm -hmm. It just feels a lot more boundaried and comfortable, I think, um, because frankly, our clients come to us trying to think of like a decorous way to say this um they're often <laughs> very naive and very unskilled so there's it can be really difficult to kind of like relationally raise someone into an adult and then and the then oh the wow yeah so it's really uncomfortable so it's sort of that's sort of what what's present why i've had such challenge with the work is like it feels really good to do the more like instructional coaching kind of container or the erotic, but to do the whole transition arc is like, it's, it just feels a little like you're, it just feels, it feels a little incesty. It feels a little like, I don't know. I can't quite clarify the ick, but it's just like, but we love, we love I incest know, on not, this show. Exactly. Not in the hot, <laughs> it, not, in, not, not, not the hot kind of incest that you look for. Not this, the hot stepmom incest on Pornhub. But like, yeah, so it's something we've just been trying to figure out together. And this is something, so I have a, a, a client coming up um, that's graduated to erotic that I'll be seeing. So we're trying out this modality and seeing. That's works. really cool. That's even just like hearing you say that I'm having like aha moments in my mind and it just makes so much sense. That yeah. really makes so much sense. It makes me think of, you know, like we've both been out as queer for quite a while and like sometimes I don't know if this has happened to you but sometimes I will meet people or on dating apps whatever people who are like newly out and there's mm -hmm. a level of discomfort with that too where it's sort of like am I your lover which involves being like equal and reciprocal or am I your instructor which makes or like your sherpa yeah your sherpa your guide which is also totally legitimate but there but it's hard to be erotic and erotic and in, in guide mode do you know what i'm saying like yeah totally totally yeah i mean i had an experience with someone a couple years ago that was like mm -hmm. that spot i mean he was like explicitly asking for that and i was like i'm not here for that like yeah, i'm not someone. i'm not trying to do that yeah and we exist hire us please I'm right to go to grad school pay me right right <laughs> I mean, even just in a more like mundane, you know, community based way, like I, I don't want to handhold someone through those awakenings and date them. I mean, I don't even necessarily want to handhold someone through those awakenings at all, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Like, and that's not, you know, I, I can feel a, a version of me from, a, from, some years ago being like hearing that and being like, oh no, I'm gonna be like a burden on my friends or whatever. Like if I, you know, I'm like new to that, but it's like, it's it's not that, it's not that. And like, if I were close with someone and they were having those experiences and those kind of, you know, awakening moments, like I wouldn't abandon them. Mm -hmm. But like for a new friend who's like at a point you know, where they're like, like, I just would, I, I don't want to be leaned on that way in a relationship where we're, where we're equals, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this, this is also, I think it sort of moves into something we were talking about before we recorded, which is, um, you know, just that sometimes I have relationships with people who don't have all the skills that I have yeah. and that that can create <clears throat> schism difficulty. And frankly, the relationship doesn't work because there's like, right just a discrepancy and I and I'm like I can't my instinct as somebody who recently realized she's probably codependent is to <laughs> recently <laughs> yeah I know I know you, I'm always the last person at the party is sort of fucking god um but yeah like that I I'm like well this person isn't going to figure it out unless I help them right which is I think anyone who's not codependent would be like so what, what? right like, right like why is that your problem right <laughs> Well, I mean, that's interesting. And I also like, I'm hearing uh, that, po that thing that you said about like, you know, you'll date people who like, don't have the skills that you have. Like you're an incredibly skilled person in, in a really specific set of skills of like, you know, communication, sex, 
like that that is your domain you know yeah. like you have training you have certifications you have like that is what you do for me it's like and i've said this before for for years now like i'm not going to date someone where i have to get you up to speed on like the basics of consent and gender, basically. Those are like, those are my two, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say like, of course I'm gonna have to teach anyone who knows me how I feel and what language I like and how I like to practice consent and in what scenarios and like how I feel about my gender. But it's a very different thing to have to be like, what is non-binary, you know? And like, I, I do, it is really important to me to be a person who people feel comfortable coming to with like what they might fear are stupid questions. And I do have friends in my life now. I mean, I I have opened up a bit. I think my patience has expanded a little, but like, you know, I have to really get a, a sense that someone is, you know, like wants to learn and is curious. But, you know, like a friend of mine recently was like, what is trans mask? really mean like does that mean that someone has transitioned or like or or and then i think she also said something like when someone transitions to non non-binary you know and like so th- so we had to have some like conversations about just like the nuancy stuff of that but like this is a person with queer friends who is queer who like you know and just like doesn't have a lot of exposure to the language of gender identity and so on um but yeah, like if I have to, if I feel like I have to teach you how to, like what consent is, like we can't date, dude, you know? Yeah, 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 it's 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 interesting to be like, it, when you were talking, I was like, oh, I'm like the N- Liam Nielsen of like sex and relationships. Like I have a very specific set of skills. Do you remember this movie oh, where he's like rescuing no. his kidnapped daughter or whatever? I never like, saw it. Yeah. I know yeah. what movie you're talking about, but so. somebody knows what we're talking about. Yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting. It reminded me too, like I, uh, I have a client who has requested that I'm going to try to anonymize this as much as possible that I, I use a strap on with them. Mm-hmm. Um, this person has a front hole. Mm-hmm. And I do not have a lot of experience doing that. I do a lot of pegging, but yeah. So I had to like go to my group of friends and be like, who would be willing to let me practice on them? And we can discuss like, what's a fair exchange? Huh. Like, what is this? Do you want me to take you to dinner? Do you want me to give you I was orgasm? not asked. You were not it? asked. No, it's true. You weren't asked. I didn't ask you. I didn't even think to ask you. That's so funny. Why didn't I think to ask you? I don't know, but I absolutely would. Oh my God. Amazing. Okay. Well, now I know if my friend uh, falls through, but I'm like, what feels it's, it, it's such a, like I'm a like, fair exchange. Yeah. I'm like, would you be willing to let me practice? And like, what it's, it's such an interesting thing. Yeah. To be like, this isn't relational. It's you doing me a favor. So like, how can it, but I think that's as right. opposed to wrapping it up in relationship, which is a very different thing. Right. Well, and I'm also thinking about like, okay, so like the, what, what I could totally see happening is that someone would be like, no, I would love that. So you don't owe me anything, mm-hmm. but there's actually, and that might, that might be a little bit codependent well, it's interesting too, because I'm like, okay, but w- when I hear somebody's like, I would love that, I'm like, actually, you won't, because this isn't going to be a passionate, loving thing. It's, I right. need you. I need you to give me a lot of feedback. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That angle's weird, or you know, that that's what I need from you. Like a very technical right. experience. Yeah. Right. Well, but even like that, I could see someone being like, that would be so fun. I mean, that would be so fun for me. Like, I would thoroughly enjoy that. However, what I'm getting at is like, in order to have the boundaries. I do think there has to be some kind of exchange and and that is going to benefit both you and the person that you do this with because it gives you clarity around what's going on. Yeah. So my friend that ended up being like, no, I'd really love that. She said, I actually haven't bottomed with a strap on ever. I've only ever topped. So it would be really great. I haven't either. What? Mm Mm-mm. No. Yeah, I'm coming over right now. I have a, I have a <laughs> bag of dicks. I'm going to fresh boil them on your stove and you get to pick. I'm on like, my way. I love you. I, I, <laughs> no, I never have. And I, I even like 
got a strap on a harness for my girlfriend and then we broke up very promptly after that so that didn't end up happening for me Shakespearean tragedy Jesus yeah I know I just like have it in my bedside bucket it's not really a table it's like a giant thing with a lid void of sex toys um yeah I will get it to them I'll uh, it's it's theirs honestly okay. like it's not really mine um but uh yeah no that's never happened for me oh wow it's all I do is bottom it's all I do yeah, we we date different kinds, you know. Um, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a thing in in queer sex a lot. Like, I have to communicate to people that like I can pop. It's just not gonna like if you're somebody who needs to like bottom out. Like, I'm probably not your girl. Like for work, I can absolutely bring that energy. You know what I mean? But like, right? Yeah, which is why I need the practice, and I rely right, on the right, loving right. community. Yeah. Allow me to. <laughs> I love the idea that we could just like, you know, trade almost like, yeah, like, like real sex education practice mm -hmm. with each other. Um, I know yes. what we could trade, Risen. What? I know what? what we could trade. I can't tell you on the, on the oh. air. Oh my God. It's that scandalous. Yeah. I'm so excited. I'll tell you later. Okay. Um, <laughs> it'll be, it'll, we'll, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. I'm just kidding. Oh my God. I don't know if this is going to be okay. Um, I'll tell you later. Okay. okay. Um, what, well, okay. I was think we were talking about codependency and we were talking about needs and I think there's something, you know, and, and then there's like people pleasing. I feel like there's like kind of a Venn diagram there or like sure. something like that. Like I could make some kind of infographic, but like, say, yeah. yeah. Um, so if, something that I have, I have worked so hard over the last several years with my therapist and have come a long way around my like appeasement impulse. And I've been thinking about it recently, particularly around the idea of like disappointing people. I was writing something about this today where I was like, you know, I don't, I, I, I fear that people are mad at me more than I fear mm -hmm. disappointing people. Like I know a lot mm -hmm. of people really have a fear of like letting people down and disappointing them. I'm really mm -hmm. more concerned that people are mad at me. And I think it's cause I'm a cancer. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. I'm like, Oh, everyone thinks I'm a bad person now. That's yeah. Everyone's more my... pissed. I, yeah. yeah. Like everyone is, you know, people put a period at the end of a text and I'm like, Oh my God, what did I do? It's over. Yeah. So anyway, but this idea of like, okay. So like, as I've learned to appease, less i've come to see that like other people out there people who are not me are gonna have needs and boundaries perhaps even accessibility needs around you know various kinds of disability physical intellectual whatever and i can decide in checking in with my capacity, my boundaries and my needs, what I can give. Right. And sometimes, you know, you said this earlier, like there's a crisis. Right. And so it's like, yeah, it's 2 a.m. and I'm really tired, but like I'm going to push myself a little bit because you're whatever. So, you know, and, and even like not in crisis, there's like moments where you can give a little more. And I think that's important in like intimate relationships. But anyway, where I'm going with this is like my needs are not going to change. So like your you may have needs that are in conflict with my needs. Mm -hmm. My needs don't change. You may need certain accommodations from me. I then have to be realistic with both you and myself about what accommodations I'm able to make, but my needs don't change. And I see this in you know in like early consent learning a lot where people are like afraid that they're not giving people enough space to say no to them or they're afraid that people won't be able to say no to them or they're afraid to ask for anything you know they're afraid that like expressing a desire or making a request or expressing a preference is going to put pressure on other people and i made my class a couple weeks ago say out loud my need i am allowed to have needs i am allowed to have needs and my needs are not going to change based on your needs like that is just 
it's not personal. It's, it's, you know, incompatibility is not personal. Yeah, it makes me think of like that maybe that's kind of what codependency is, is when I erode my needs for the benefit of yours. Do you yes. Know I mean? yeah. yeah. There's a lot of like, I am still learning. I'm recently becoming aware that I might be codependent. <laughs> um, And one of the things I really like to do is overwhelm myself by never saying no to the point that I'm like, drowning and sick with stress my friend was joking um who she's been in 12 step for codependency for like 10 years i was rubbing my neck my shoulder like i have a little neck thing and she was like oh that's the international sign of a codependent it's like oh does your neck hurt does your back hurt like because we're just this this type of person who does who's codependent or whatever just takes on so much that they like like manifest like physical symptoms of being burdened of being the weight of the world yes like stretch too thin like I have no time like you know I'm so busy like you know what I'm saying because there's an inability to be like uh that's enough or like right no, or like do you know what I mean I think what this is bringing up for me is like also the way like, I'm wondering if you can almost be like codependent with like past versions of yourself. Cause I, mm. I just, I just wrote this piece on, on Substack about commitment as like a um, sort of spiritual practice of engaging with like past versions of you on an ongoing basis and like being in dialogue with them. And, you know, that like, I, I made a promise to myself at 16 that I was going to pursue acting. Mm. And then at, you know, 21, 22, 23, really had to engage in these conversations with that version of myself that was like, hey, it turns out you're a writer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like you are a writer, you know? And like, it turns out you want to direct. And that all, you discovered all of that because you let yourself finally fall in love with what acting really is. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. digging at a deep human truth and like being present and listening. And like, you know, maybe you'll perform, but like, you're not going to be like, we're not going to do this, you know? Right. And so like that sort of as an ongoing practice is like something that I, that shows up in my art a lot. Like, you know, I could go into it, but I won't just read the article on Substack and pay me $8. <laughs> um, but what you're talking about, this idea of codependency, like, you know, I was thinking about you in school mm. and how like, there, you know, when you started, maybe you were like, I'm going to be a straight A student. And then turns out life is lifing. And perhaps there are moments where you now have to say no to things that past you said you were going to do, such as like, you know, we talked about this, like, sometimes you have to be like, I'm actually not going to do that one assignment. I'm not going to do that reading. I'll catch up if I can. But if I can't, that's okay. You know, yeah, releasing perfectionism yes. is a big part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. The the other piece that I've been writing is about um FOMO mm -hmm. as a like a facet of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. That like it's it's just this fear of like making the wrong choice. And like when you can get to a point where you have some kind of faith in and you know, here's are we going to do God today? Like if, if, when you can like find faith in like the design that has been set out for you, then there's, you're never, you never make the wrong choice, you know, like you're always in the right place at the right time. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, the perfectionism and like fear of making the wrong choice. I wonder if those two things are related because absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that's, oftentimes you know and it also reminds me of somatics like instead of listening to my brain voice right listening to my body voice for lack of a better term like yeah what is my like trying to defer I'm trying to defer more and more to like what does my body need like because often the impulse to do more is not from my body it's from my brain and based right. on shoulds and things like that right? and perceived expectations that mm -hmm. other people have of you right or that I think they have of me <laughs> exactly no that's what <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah, oh, yeah, yeah but yeah, it's yeah. like you're you're making assumptions about what other people like want from you you mm -hmm. know yeah I mean I, you know I'm teaching this class unblocked that starts in two weeks and one of the things that we 
work through. I mean, it's really for artists and creatives who are like struggling with creative blocks. And it's about cultivating like a gentle relationship with and like trusting that the the flow will come and then kind mm -hmm. of like setting up the circumstances in which like once it arrives, the, there's like less friction and you have the space and time and um, cultivating a secure rela relationship with your creativity essentially mm -hmm. is like how I've been describing it. And we work through perfectionism, people pleasing, inner critic, imposter syndrome, and ultimately get to like finding your voice and like, where mm -hmm. do you see it? Where does it show up? So I think this idea of like making the wrong choice, you know, it, it can be really paralyzing for a lot of artists, especially, um, but it, it just, it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. And I feel like artists who are prolific who have gotten to a point where they can see their voice and how it shows up in like everything that they do have typically worked through enough of that perfectionism to get to a point where they're willing to put out garbage like willing to make bad art you know yeah and like not have an identity with I feel like there's sort of a a distancing as well where it's like this is not me like this mm -hmm. making the work is not me it's a right. thing that came through me right like yeah and so it's okay to put out stuff that maybe is imperfect or isn't entirely holistically my entire fucking worldview or like right that people take issue with yeah oh yeah I mean the people taking issue oh yeah we were gonna go there of like blocking someone turning off comments like unblocked it, blocked unblocked to blocked <laughs> i i think this is very i think this is important and really related and can, do you want to talk about like choosing to block like what that means uh, to you i guess yeah we were talking earlier like a value i really have almost to the point of fault is communication like i just think it's really important to me to like let people know where I'm at before making a decision that could affect them, whatever. And I recently um, was instructed by somebody I really respect and defer to, to, um, to block someone who was frankly making me insane with their behavior. And what came up for me was immense guilt, um, mm -hmm. even though this was something I kind of had to do for my own mental health. Did you feel like a hypocrite? Yeah, I think so. I think I felt it it goes against This is the, here's the thing. It's like it goes against my general values around yeah. let like it's a very different thing to be like I'm going to take some space. I'm going to remove you from like I'm going to block your number for 30 days whatever as opposed to just doing it. Um the hypocrite thing but but here's the thing is it's like I don't trust that this person can be honest with me if I tell them why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, I still think I'm going to be met with undermining and manipulation, even if I'm as honest as I can be, because that's what keeps happening. And that's why, unfortunately, I've had to block them because it's it to not to not be in reality makes me insane. And this yeah. is where I the idea that I might be codependent comes from is that I I can't, I have a really hard time protecting myself at the expense of other people, even though yeah. like it's so fucking necessary sometimes. Like it makes me literally have diarrhea for three days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know the diarrhea. I'm familiar. <laughs> Is this episode diarrhea. just called this episode diarrhea? Diarrhea. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, that's funny because that's something that I was thinking about as like, like anything that I, in any medium that I work in, that I express myself in, inevitably we're going to talk about poop yeah <laughs> like 100 percent. you know like i have my entire musical like there's a toilet on stage mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. and i keep running back to the toilet and like shitting my brains out and um i wrote a spec script like a rick and morty spec script and like they do a poop transplant and like like it's just that is going to come up you know and yeah. like and then even my approach to consent it's like very much based in the gut mm -hmm. and like and so you know eventually for for people who are not dealing with their gut health like you do when i'm when i'm working with, when they're working with me like we do hit a wall if they're not willing to look at that you know what i mean yeah. but but okay wait so 
yeah, you're talking about blocking people. What, what, I'm going to say something to you that I, that my therapist said to me <laughs> in a different context, which was that like, you know, some, well, okay. It's a combo of a couple things. Um, Sara Casper, who runs comprehensive consent, taught me this really amazing values exercise mm -hmm. that I think you did in the mm -hmm. educator training. Okay. So, and you know, sometimes your values are in conflict, right? So like the, like a great example is like, you might value transparency and impact, but like, as let's say a stupper, there are times when you have to prioritize, when you choose to prioritize impact over transparency, mm -hmm. because if you were to be 100% transparent, it would reduce your impact, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. that's a really clear one. I think what you're talking about is like, you have a value of communication. You also have a value of safety. And so right now, those feel like there's like some tension there. Yeah, and it it feels also like safety is maybe becoming more of a priority than communication, yeah. whereas before communication was more of a priority. It's like, and it or at least me, in this situation, yes, you know, yes. it makes me think of too, like when you made that commitment to yourself at sixteen about being an actor. It's like what we want evolves. Right? Yeah, it's it's not like I've abandoned this commitment. It's like my desires have changed. You know, just like right now, like communication is still very important to me, but like protecting myself is actually really becoming very important to me, you know, and having those boundaries right. and things. Yeah. And also I think like, you know, new things come into your awareness. Like if you're talking about becoming aware of codependency mm -hmm. and how that comes through you, mm -hmm. then yeah, I could see how you'd be like, oh my God, I've been, I've been disregarding my need for safety and so i'm going to prioritize that extra yeah. for a mm -hmm. while you know yeah yeah it's like for, realizing you have a vitamin deficiency and then being like damn i gotta take b12 whoa. all the fucking time now right and i'm gonna put yeah. a reminder in my phone and i'm gonna mm -hmm. yeah yeah for for me around like this you know this issue well first of all i recently blocked someone who said some stuff online that quite frankly i just thought was annoying <laughs> I support this so much. Um, I just don't really want to hear, like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. So goodbye. You know, it was using a lot of this like lingo that I like only see online that feels so, oh God, do I say consent, this? Consent 1.0. It, it feels, it feels like accountability 1.0 mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's like the blue haired vibe like that i'm sorry that is just how i feel and so i yes was i read it and i was like this is annoying so i blocked them i'm allowed to do that mm -hmm. that's a boundary it's a pretty clear boundary this person then got my email and emailed me this like pretty lengthy thing about how you know if i blocked them i must have experienced harm that they also experienced harm oh, Christ from me. Right. Blah, blah, blah. I won't go like more into it, but it just kind of was like, you know, blocking someone is a very legitimate boundary, especially like if we don't fucking know each other. Yeah, we're not no, in a relationship. We're though. not in relationship. And I'm not interested in establishing a relationship with you. I don't know you. And I also can tell from a lot of the language and like the, the sort of buzzwords that are coming through that we just are not going to see eye to eye and that and that this is at least you know in my experience like indicators that someone is like um looking with a magnifying glass for hypocrisy to call out you know what i mean mm -hmm. so, anyway this all like comes out of though uh that a couple years ago i decided to turn comments off entirely on my instagram page i have thirty five thousand followers on my instagram page now that is a lot of people and I share pretty vulnerably, I think, on my page. Um, and I was really torn about it because I was like, you know, there's going to be people who follow me, notice that they can't comment and then unfollow me. There's going to be people who say I'm like, like, um, uh, preventing discourse, that I'm skirting ac uh, accountability or feedback, which people have said. Um, and there's going to be and, you know, people have said to me, people have DM'd me and said, like, because I can't comment, I'm unfollowing you. And I'm like, what I hear in that is like, 
because you can't publicly disagree with me, you're no longer interested in what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's your prerogative. But to me, I'm like, do you feel that way about the TV you watch, the books you read, the articles you read? Like, do you feel that way? Like, yeah, I mean, it makes me think of when we went to the Whitney and there was that big exhibit. And I just, in my head, it's like, am I, do I just have post-it notes and I'm writing down my thoughts and putting them on the fucking exhibit? Right. Like, like, I don't like this painting because I find it offensive in this way. I'm going to look up this artist's Instagram and DM them about it. Like, no way. Yeah. No way. You know, no one is like listening to a song and thinking like, how do I tell Miley Cyrus that this is offensive? Right. I mean, though, some people do, right? I sure, mean, some people sure. really do. It's, like, a, it's entitlement. It is a lot of entitlement. It's entitlement to access. It's like that they they think they are entitled to access you in like more intimate ways than I am open to, you know, Mm -hmm. like these are my boundaries Mm -hmm. because I don't know you and I don't necessarily want to know you. Mm -hmm. And I that is that is okay, you know, And but that getting to that place with it took so much like internal work and so much processing and a lot of therapy and a lot of friends saying to me, I cannot talk to you anymore about the shit that strangers say to you on the internet. Like whether they said it explicitly or it was kind of like clear in their face or tone or whatever, like it just, it just got to a point where I was like, I don't, my mental health is worth more to me than a few people being annoyed or disappointed that I don't let them have conversations about me and my work where my work is, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it speaks to this thing of being like, I'm having this boundary because this is taking up too much of my time, right? Like that's exactly it. Yeah. It's like, this is just not actually worth all this energy to be sitting here talking about user 8.71 had a problem with what I had to say. Like, why am I? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's also, you know, when, when, you know, talk about, you were talking about like reality, like having a shared reality. I mean, Mm. when someone misinterprets something I say and then sort of like goes on a rant about their misinterpretation to me, I'm like, okay, you're telling me that we don't really have a shared reality. Um, There's also a way that like a lot of stuff online, I think gets taken as like, like, no matter how much I say, I think this is true for me in my experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's still like, so empirically, you're saying that. Yeah, You're saying that these are red flags for codependency. And I'm like, okay, if that's how you're interpreting this, I'm not safe even in this parasocial relationship because, because you are interpreting what I share as my experience as me saying that this is fact. Right. You're interpreting it as dogma. And right. You're literally just, it's this thing about grace. Like people just can't, they're like, oh, you have a platform. So therefore. Yes. And that was in the comment. That was in what this person said. Like, like comments are off on this page. So I'm going to talk about this here. It's like, you see, I have a boundary about this and you're just deciding to find a workaround. Totally your prerogative. You can do that you can do that, but then I get to react however I react. You know, comments are off, so I'm gonna talk about this here. Uh, You know, and then they said that I was like pathologizing people who say, I miss you really fast in a dating dynamic. Did that would have a, did that post about red flags? Um, Was it red flags about people who might be codependent? What was it? It was things I, it says, things I used to think were romantic that I now think are codependency red flags. My friend I had coffee with uh, showed it to me and she was like, Mia posted this and, and showed it. She was like, I love this one. And I love this one too. But we were like laughing about it. She was like, I love when people text me all the time. She's like, that's my favorite. And we were joking about it because it's so clear that it's like, this is what works for Mia. And this is what works for Obviously. you. Right. Right. But also it might mean that the person you're dating has some codependency. Like yeah. it, and that might be fine. Right. Like it doesn't mean don't date them. No. I'm saying I am a person who has gotten love bombed more times than I can count. It is. And I've had to ask myself, like, what am I doing to mm-hmm. attract that? You know what I mean? But like, 
these are things that have consistently happened in situations where someone has come on really strong and then pulled away really fast. Mm -hmm. So for me, this yeah. is what it is. Who is your friend? Do I know this person? Luce. They know who you met Luce and her now husband when we were at the park and they walked by Luce. Oh yeah, your your musical record. theater friend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. she's a filmmaker. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, it's like I can I can no matter how much I say like this is true for me. But anyway, the the point being me setting that boundary has pissed off a lot of people. Mhm. Mm and I have had to work through my own fear of disappointing people or making people mad at me in order to get to a place where I don't care what strangers think, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that is always, um, you know, ch ch waffling, like change, teetering. Like mm -hmm. I can, most of the time, I don't care what strangers think. And then <laughs> I do for a sec, you know? Yeah. Because something happens. Um, and, and having my, having my, Instagram page locked down so tight has improved my mental health. It has improved my physical health. It has improved my IRL relationships. It has made keeping this page going sustainable for me. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, just like any artist, you know, like Daniel Day-Lewis locks himself in a hotel room for a couple months when he's getting into character. It's like artists have to have boundaries. And for, for most people, I think a lot of times those boundaries are weird or like right. at least unconventional. You know what I mean? But like to create yeah. real shit, I think you do have to have non-normative, maybe non-normative boundaries or like boundaries that are specific to you that maybe like other people have issue with. Like I'm sure people are like, where the fuck is Daniel Day-Lewis? Like, right. <laughs> He's in the Ritz, leave him alone. I actually have like specific thoughts and issues with method actors, but, <laughs> but I won't go into it. But um, because, well, mainly because everyone else has to just go along with whatever the fuck you're doing. And I, I think that's genius, kind of fucked up. So. Yeah, yeah, he's a genius. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's kind of fucked up, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, oh no, wait, you were gonna say, you said something about the boundaries and the, um, like unconventional oh oh no it made me think of like you know i think of what i do as like part of my artistic self-expression mm -hmm. even when i'm teaching like to me teaching feels like a like a form of artistic self-expression it's like a medium for that however i can see how a lot of people would be like but you're an educator mm -hmm. like this is this is educational material so you don't get the same protections that like an artist would get you know you have to be open to the discourse and open to the dialogue and open to the feedback and the commentary and like okay fine in certain circumstances but like i i really do think of what i do as like part of my body of work as an artist um well, and again like no, i'll I'll, ta I'll take the feedback from people in my classes exactly. i'll take the feedback from people i have relationships with yeah, I'm not going to take the feedback from like randos on the internet. Right. Exactly. It's like, what, why is your feedback worth my attention? Like, are you my colleague? Are you my student? Are you, right. I don't even know if I respect your opinion. Right. No, 100%. So often I'm like, you could be 12 years old. You could be, uh, you know, an incel cosplaying as a SJW. Like you could be, why do I have to? I, I don't know you homie like straight up right, yeah and right. the, the level at which because I don't have my comments off but like the level at, and I you know I actually I'm I kind of love when people troll me because it's funny but I I mean the stuff I talk about is a little more pithy I think too than what you're talking about but like it's interesting how people just fundamentally do not actually see what I'm talking about and like take it an entirely different way do you know what I mean like right constantly. well that's that's the shared reality thing. It's mm -hmm. like, and, and, you know, in relationships now, I'm looking for evidence that we have a shared reality. And it's, it's required a change because, because I think it's easy to notice when you don't have a shared reality, like you slip out and you're like, what the fuck? Like you thought that was what we were talking about. I thought this was what we were talking about, but I've started to notice the green flags of like, oh, you told the same story almost the same exact way 
multiple times. You told it to me and I watched you tell it to your friend. That tells me that you have like a consistent narrative, you know, like you're a trustworthy narrative of your own experience in your own life. Okay, that's a really great sign. You know, someone that I'm dating like repeats back to me things that I've said. And I'm like, yes, that is what I said. And that mm -hmm. is how I meant it. You know, mm -hmm. like you, you felt, you clearly felt the intention behind what I was saying in addition to hearing the words. And the only information that is different is that you're now telling me how you felt about it, how it made you feel. And that's really valuable information for me. And then when you tell me later how you feel, it's pretty consistent. <laughs> you know, like these are good signs. These yes. are good signs. Um, and I've noticed even for myself, like that sometimes in hindsight, things start to change you know, like panic might set in because I thought I was fine about something and then I haven't heard from you in 12 hours. And so now I'm feeling less fine about it. And I'm looking at the things that were said earlier and, da, 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 you know, and like some of that can be mitigated. Some of it is from trauma. Some of it is like, I just need more time or whatever. But like, I do need to know that we share the majority of our realities so that I can trust you. And so that I don't fear that your truth is going to change all the time. Yeah, I feel like something we talked about earlier is, that I've noticed is like my version of that right now is what is this person's relationship to reality, period. Yeah, Not yeah. even like their subjective reality, my subjective reality overlap, but just like when something crazy happens, how do they respond? Like if something bad happens or if they're, if somebody tells them you hurt my feelings, like what is their reaction? Can they, can they truly just face what's happening? Somebody right. got hurt. You hurt my feelings. Oh, wow. Somebody got hurt. What should we do? Oh, I hurt your feelings. I'm so sorry. Let's talk about yeah. it. Can you even do that? Because I feel like I notice a lot. And I'm somebody who with a history of addiction has like really fought to be in reality because I had 10 years of major reality avoidance through substances, you know? So reality is like really important to me and it's dangerous for me when I find myself in a relationship with people who can't be in reality like it's really scary for me yeah yeah, yeah. like trying to escape or or yeah I had my my best friend in high school one of my best friends in high school and and through a good portion of college I I really began to notice like you know I would be with her for something that happened and then she would tell someone about it later in front of me. And it was wildly different from what actually happened. Like, and the, she, like, like if you saw a car crash, for example, or something, she would describe it totally differently. Like if we had an experience out together, you know, oh, we ran into so-and-so and, -so and mm -hmm. they said this and, you know, and then we all went to this thing and then this happened. And like, I was there for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then later she's like recounting the events of the evening to someone else. And it's just like completely different. Like, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's like out of chronological order or it's like, I see how you felt that that's what she said, but that is entirely not what she said. Or like, yeah. you know, or, or, or I mean, things like saying, you know, well, she, she gave me, like, she bought me a drink. And it's like, no, you told her to get you a drink. You know what I mean? It's like those yeah, yeah, kinds yeah. of like mm -hmm. twists of things. Like, um, and, and it just, I mean, this, this was a compulsive liar. Like she was, she was like truly a compulsive liar, but didn't think that she was lying. I mean, and this is where I learned that, that like most compulsive liars are like, they they don't think that they're lying they, they're they seeing what they see you know yeah compulsive and, lying is fascinating yeah it's really hard for me discern right it's like yeah, no well some i forget where i read this but it's i think we've talked about this it's exclusively comorbid with personality disorder like it doesn't exist in like a uh, vacuum and like hmm. there's it's weird because i'm like you can tell someone they're lying and they'll like they'll double down oh, that they're not right 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 it's like they don't even know it like comes out of their mouth before they can check it or something it's, it's and just they don't compulsive. remember they don't remember <laughs> right i right and th that's like a thing where it's like you know you can go 
that's because they have this personality disorder and they have it because of trauma <laughs> and their relationship with their mother and like blah 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 and sure. it's like okay but your needs don't change there you go mm -hmm. i have to be in reality i can't be with somebody who can't stop lying for example like i can't it it's too psychologically distressing for me oh personally. it, it yeah. makes yeah i mean it, and it makes me feel crazy crazy it, yeah right and it's it's also like it's like how do we get anywhere with this and yeah i mean i, I don't know i i i have to go <laughs> we have to stop i gotta okay, go okay we have to stop okay yeah. well um i'll come over later and you can pick your dick okay okay <laughs> Bye, Nia. Okay, great. Bye. Bye. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye.